Shout out to Andrew Petty for donating to get this review made. You can also request reviews by going to my Patreon and following the instructions there. Now, let's get this show on the road. Back when, in 1975, there's a little show called Tekaman the Space Knight. It was produced by the same folks who did Speed Racer and Gatchaman and the like, and it failed miserably. Most prominent among those reasons is that Tekaman looked like a rainbow nightmare and flew around on a dumpy-looking robot. It was not exactly the recipe for a good series. So into the bin it went. 1992 rolled around and suddenly everything old is new again. But sometimes things don't exactly go to plan when you make something that relies on stock footage and Monster of the Week. Enter Tekaman Blade, the reboot with the bigger budget and the grittier edge. I can hear some of you rolling your eyes already at that, but at that time it was kind of unexplored territory for a TV anime. It chronicles the story of Earth under attack by the Rotom, a race of critters that mostly seem to make a mess of any planet they attack. At the head of these Rotom creatures are the Tekaman, who seem to be controlling them somehow. The Earth is particularly boned, to be honest, because the only machine that can do any damage is the Blue Earth, and that's just one ship. Yes, the Earth's military is completely baffled by a flock of mutalisks. Ever wanted to know what a Zerg rush looks like in real life? It'd be something like this. Base is under attack. Making matters worse is that the Rodham have also taken over a satellite ring that's outfitted with laser weapons that can level cities. Why was that pointed at Earth in the first place? What possible reason could there be for aiming that many lasers at one planet? And yes, before you ask, this was not the Rodham's doing. They're not smart enough to build lasers, they mostly just waddle around and look gooey. But because of this, Earth is in super big trouble. Enter Tekaman Blade, a defector from the Tekaman, who just happens to be in the neighborhood and wants to help. This bodes well for Aki and Noel, our two main human protagonists, because they're about as useful as a fart in a hurricane. After bailing them out, Tekaman Blade powers down and shows that he is in fact a human being. But somewhere between here and Tekaman City, his memories got wiped and so he remembers some of the basics, but everything else is out the window. This includes social interaction because he's a complete asshole. They name him D-Boy, which means dangerous boy, and I'm positive there is a whole one person who thought that sounded cool. And I'm sure he was paying off the rest of the staff to agree. But whoever it was, apparently he was giving George Lucas cliff notes during Attack of the Clones, because this guy is almost identical to Anakin Skywalker. He's rude, he's whiny, he's self-righteous, he's completely obnoxious, but it's all about making him a dark and brooding character. Dark and brooding is the sort of thing that you can do, but you have to be smart to do it well. A lot of writers, not quite there. Especially when it's the popular thing to do. But I think you'll get the gist of it when I say he's Anakin with a memory leak. Now, he does have a pretty solid reason for being so many million kinds of fucked up, but it is still frustrating to see it portrayed in this manner. But hey, if it gets more action into the series, I suppose it's worth it. Early on in the series, Tekaman Blade falls into a trap set by Tekaman Dagger and loses his transformation ability. Fitting for someone who, in spite of his great power, is kind of stupid, he's forced to rely on the other members of the Blue Earth crew to give him a way to transform. Working on this are Honda, the mechanic, and the least subtle homosexual character ever created by humankind, Levin. Leron wishes he was this flamboyant. I suppose it was 1992 and the idea of such a thing was sort of quaint, but in our enlightened age it just seems rather crass. The English version made him into a her for the sake of getting it aired, so take that how you will. Together, Levin and Honda create Pegasus, a machine that can let D-Boy transform into Tekaman again, and not a moment too late. And this is within the first seven episodes. Yeah, this show is weirdly dense. So around the same time, the major villain shows up called Tekaman Evil. And work begins on a human-operated power suit called Soul Tekaman, which is basically a big clunker of a robot with a BFG stuck on it. At the same time, we're also introduced to the other evil Tekaman, led by Evil, who is also a Tekaman. Ah. Uh and Tekaman Rapier, who is the girl. 
It is at this point that I realize that this isn't really a mecha show. It's a common writer show. Let me explain. The breakdown of a common writer style show is basically this. Lone hero starts off fighting the monster of the week. The monsters get stronger. The hero gets a sidekick. Hero gets an upgrade. Sidekick gets sidelined. Hero squares off against the big bad all in his lonesome at the end. Tekaman follows roughly the same formula. The episodes are vaguely interconnected through the side characters, but mostly what you can look forward to in the show is the transformation and the super finishing moves. What the main characters do is actually kind of pointless in the grand scheme of things, because they're just there to make action happen. The interesting story parts are more with the human characters, which is a problem because this is where the show grinds to a screeching halt. The more action-oriented characters in the Rodham are kind of incidental more than anything else to the story for the majority of the show. It's the kind of show that mostly happens in the background, where the main characters in the foreground kind of get stuck with making minutes pass. Oh no, we ran into the place where the aliens are, despite knowing full well that the aliens were there. Our weapons are useless, even though we've already known that our weapons are completely useless. It's kind of difficult to feel bad for them when they run screaming headlong into danger without any real idea of how to keep from getting skewered beyond let Tekka Man handle it. The show has a definite problem with tone, as it's surprisingly dark and violent, but the premise itself is kind of hard to take seriously. They do a good job of keeping it fairly grounded, but when you have bug monsters throwing spores at Earth while superhumans in battle armor beat the paste out of each other, it's only got so much serious cred to spend. This is where the show starts to fall apart. The premise is pretty good, there's nothing inherently wrong with the story as a whole, but the characters are extremely one-note, and the pacing is atrocious. This balancing act between keeping the story moving and filling out that 49-episode contract is something that still hasn't been figured out to this day and was a particularly big issue in the early and mid-90s. And I think you guys have probably figured out the biggest problem with the show because you've seen several of the scenes over and over again. Hand to Heaven ripped them from different episodes. Yes, the show loves its stock footage because it keeps costs down. And if the art in the series is any indication, costs were real low. There's nothing wrong with stock footage as a concept, but man, when you see it abused to this degree, with such mediocre art to bolster it, I wonder if I'm watching Voltron sometimes. In all seriousness, this show looks only marginally better than a show that came out almost a decade prior. This show needed a lot more quality control than it clearly got, but... Hey, when you only have to put together three-fourths or even half of an episode in some cases, may as well just let it ride. This is a visual medium. You cannot neglect the visuals. It would be like shooting a TV show, but one of the cameras has fallen over and no one picked it up. And yes, I do get that this is inherently hypocritical of me, considering how my show looks most of the time, but you know what? I'm not a TV anime. At the same time, the story doesn't really offend me, and the character designs are pretty cool. The show is surprisingly violent and dark for a show that runs like a live-action superhero show. It's not on the level of, say, blue gender, but it's still pretty shocking for the time, and the stark bleakness of the setting is unnerving. Aki is cool-headed and capable, where they could have just made her some dumb damsel like usual, and all the characters gelled together in a more or less natural way. Likewise, the way they handle D-Boy is kind of obnoxious at the outset, because he is just the crankiest little dweeb. But as his character develops, he actually becomes somewhat likable. This doesn't stop with his brooding nature, but the problems he faces have a more human face to them. Initially, he's worried about going berserk if he stays in Tekaman mode too long, but once he gets his super mode, called Tekaman Blaster, it actually starts wiping parts of his memories. Squeezing out a happy ending of this suddenly got a whole lot harder. It should be also mentioned that there is a whole lot of extra material that comes with it. There were three OVA that were released that are vaguely connected or retellings of certain episodes, and then a full OVA series after the show called Tech of Blade 2. So in spite of its major flaws, the series was popular enough to merit extra content. Additionally, there was an English version of it called Tech No Man that somehow got airtime but had to be cut to ribbons for it because it was being released in 1994. So if you're going to go in on this one, be aware of which version you're getting your hands on. So here's the caveat for Tech of Man Blade. If you've gone through Sentai or Kamen Rider shows before without much concern in the way the shows are designed, then Tekka Man will be like putting on a comfy pair of shoes. If you're looking for something dark that doesn't pull many punches, it might sate your bloodlust. But if you're looking for something that respects your time and holds together well, you may want to look somewhere else. But you know what? 
this show looks really cool. It's banking on its aesthetic, and I'll give it props for having a pretty good one. If you're okay with a series that's intensely flawed but still put together enough to hold your interest, then this show will fit the bill quite nicely. Just be aware that the only thing that's polished on this one is Tekaman's armor.